Thank you for joining us today. We are joined by Kathy Gerwell from the Printing Museum. And Kathy has years of experience in the fields of paper and graphic art studying in Paris and continuing as a curator fellow at the Tamarind Lithography Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, well as the Awagami Paper Factory in Japan. But she has demonstrated paper making in San Francisco, Santa Fe, and Houston, where she now lives. She makes paper in both the Western and Japanese styles, working with fibers such as cotton, linen, kozo, abaca, and flax. And she's taught workshops in Houston and the surrounding areas for over 20 years and has been a longtime supporter of the Printing Museum. So we are so happy to have her joining us today. So Kathy, I'm going to hand it over to you, and then I'm also going to share my screen. Hi, thank you all for joining us. It's been a little bit of a challenge this morning with the technology and the rain here in Houston. But um, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, paper and parchment and um, writing surfaces. And I'd like to start a long time before then uh, about, um, ah, there we go with our introduction. I'd like to start thinking about the fact that man first made marks about 260,000 years ago, if not earlier than that, and was in the Stone Age at that time. So he made marks on walls and caves, as we know, and shelves and cliffs, uh, maybe stone tablets. It was a long time before something changed. Um, and woven cloth came in 6,000 years BC. Well, this was from 260,000 years to 6,000 years BC was a big difference. And um, a long time it happened, but cloth as a, as a uh, substance, a woven substance was developed. So next big jump would be to papyrus, 4,000 years BC, 6,000 years ago from our date now. And I think that it's interesting to look at papyrus and notice that it has, of course, um, perpendicular uh, angles on it, like weaving. I think that uh, the ancients saw weaving and began to realize that this was a good pattern and they could they saw this very uh, plentiful plant of papyrus in their environment and they were able to make that transition from cloth to plant. Very fascinating time. Parchment came in 1500 BC. That too. So papyrus was used almost extensively through the um, Egyptian world and into Islam perhaps for uh, a long time. Then parchment and vellum were, were created, I would say, in Asia where they were taking the skin of animals. And we may lose Kathy for... Uh... Her connectivity issues. I know she was having a hard time. So I'm just going to give her a minute here. And if not, I'll jump in as needed. So while we uh, while we give Kathy a chance to reconnect, I am going to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the ones that are in the printing museums collections. The Printing Museum here in Houston has a variety of different writing surfaces, um, not just paper. So paper being the obvious one that we may think of when we're thinking of writing substrates. Only one of these on the screen actually is paper. And so that would be the bottom one, the Haikumantu Durrani scroll. And that's from the eighth century CE in Japan. And this is one of the earliest examples of printing, printing on paper. And so the seventh century predates Gutenberg by about four or 500 years. So Gutenberg wasn't the first that was printing. Um, he was just first in the Western world using the movable type. This Durrani scroll was probably printed with a wood block, but this is paper. Paper does originate in Asia um, in its paper form. And Kathy is gonna talk a lot more about that and how kind of we get to there. We also have examples where she was talking about the timeline of these different writing instruments. If we go back to the oldest ones, mark making, the Mesopotamian seals, stone seals, that is making a print. You're able to use that multiple times, make multiple copies of something. And so we have examples of that in the printing museum too. And those are our oldest artifacts. Um, we have a lot of unique writing substrates as well, such as the palm leaf book on the left here. And so those are from East Asia where the Indonesia 
where you have palm fronds that are able to become cut and then you scratch and inscribe on them and they are written and held together with a string that goes through the middle of it, kind of like shades or blinds. Um, it's a really innovative, unique book structure, uh, very different from the traditional scroll that you see elsewhere in the ancient world. And then later the codex, the book that we're used to today. Um, on the right hand side, we have in the top right, parchment, which is an animal skin. And that is uh, from Africa, an Ethiopian binding. And then in the bottom, it's a facsimile that we have on display at the museum because this is a representation of a New World accordion book. There are very few of those remaining, um, and there's about 10 in the world. So we have a facsimile to be able to, to show the size and format of these. But these were also on either a mate bark paper or in the Aztec world, um, the Mayans used the mate bark. Aztecs were using more parchment, which is deer uh, skin that they had available to make their books. And so we've got this really interesting collection of all sorts of artifacts. Um, it's not all just printing on paper, which I know is always kind of the common and the easiest thing to think of. And so those are some of the more interesting artifacts um, for me when I'm giving tours that I like to highlight for people that I wanted to share with all of you guys. I'm going to uh, just check on Kathy here real quick. Um, she is probably still connecting. She's doing her best. We have had, unfortunately, some internet issues today. So our agenda today is that Kathy is going to talk about writing surfaces up to paper. And then she's going to go into more in depth about the different plants and then the papers that they're used in and fibers over the centuries. And she has an amazing collection of all of these different papers that she's got to share with us. And we have screenshots too, so that you're able to see them more closely. And then I also have done an experiment in making papyrus. So it went all right. And I might just jump down to the end and talk about that while we, uh, we're waiting for Kathy here. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. And a question on how old is the, the Ethiopian binding? That is a great question. Let me just check my notes here for you. The, okay, so the papyrus fragment is from 300, 350 to BCE that we have. It is uh, written in Greek. So it is a, a Ptolemaic uh, papyrus being much later in, the Egyptian pyramids, um, Egyptian timeline. Um, but that's actually closer to the period when the Library of Alexandria was closer to competing with the great libraries in Pergamum in Turkey. And there's a whole fascinating side history of papyrus versus parchment um, when Egypt decides to not export their papyrus. And that was the main writing material of the time. And so in Turkey, in Pergama, their library decides to kind of experiment more and start copying their books onto parchment. And so Pergama, uh, the word parchment, they are synonymous and intertwined because it originally came from that. So our Ethiopian binding was the question is how old is that? Um, let me see. That is, this one in particular is from the 13th century. And so that is parchment ink, and then it's sewn on board. So it's still, still fairly old, but not, um, not as old for uh, context. And is there a source? Another question, is there a source for papyrus to try it? Absolutely. This is the really fun thing is that you can still buy papyrus. You don't have to go to Egypt. You can get it from art supply stores when they have like a broad range of papers available. I've seen it for sale in person around Houston, um, but you can also buy it online. I know that there are specialty paper stores that I like to frequent. So hollanders.com is one or Talus. And so I have bought actual sheets of papyrus and used them in book bindings. So I have rebound a book that is about papyrus and I've used the papyrus font because I could, I'm a huge nerd. And then I have used papyrus itself to rebind the covers of my book. But it 
is a kind of a, a brittle material. That's why the scroll structure developed. It made more sense to do that. Amazon is another great place, absolutely, to find papyrus. Um, you don't generally see papyrus used in a, a Western book like this because you have to bend it around the corners and it's brittle. Um, that is why the scroll is so much better because you're wrapping it around itself. That's more its natural inclination. Um, and it's a matter of how you're making it that it wants to just roll up. So let me scroll down to when I'm talking about my papyrus experiment. Now, papyrus, I thought, would grow uh, wild here in Houston. It doesn't. It's still native to Egypt. But I was really surprised when I found a... Um, version of what looked like papyrus to me in my backyard. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again here. Okay, so what I found was umbrella plant. True Egyptian papyrus is very feathery at the tip. It doesn't um, have these broad flat pieces at the end, but it's very similar because these are both in the sedge um, family of plants. So the key characteristic is that it has a tall, long stalk, and you're using the stalks to create the uh, papyrus pieces. You're chopping off the top half anyway. So I have umbrella plant in my backyard. So the first thing you need to do is cut the stalks into sections and then use a knife or some other material to take off the hard exterior parts of the papyrus stalk because that's not gonna work. What we're aiming for is using the white pithy parts in the interior that has the cellulose and the glues. And so once you've skinned it, then you have to cut it into strips. And so on the left, you can see that progression where I've got the full stalk. It's actually very tiny. If I were using true Egyptian papyrus, that is at least one inch wide. Mine was five to eight millimeters like half a centimeter wide. So my plant is very narrow and tiny. So I was doing this process in miniature. So I was able to get the papyrus uh, peel, the exterior skin off, and then I cut it into strips. So you wanna cut it into thin layers and then you wanna pound it because that's gonna make it even thinner. It's gonna break down those cell walls, kind of activate the glue that is in the pith and the natural plant. And then you're able to soak them. So not only does pounding it activate the glues that you're gonna need, it also makes it wider. So I was able to double the width of my strips here. And it might not be obvious, but in the middle photo, you can see the stalk versus half of one of those cut pieces pounded out. After doing that, then you wanna soak it. And this gives it time to let all those glues get nice and gelatinousy. Uh, you want to soak it for, I soaked mine for three days, and this is to help it break down. If you do it longer, you get a darker color papyrus. And so on the right-hand side, this is after about a couple days, the color didn't change too much. It just looks more translucent. It's hard to know when it's done. So I just did my best after three days. It was bubbly. Uh, you kind of, it's slimy. Yeah, it definitely is a plant. It's organic. Uh, it didn't smell too bad, which was good. But this the first attempt, I kind of squeegeed and wiped off all of that slime. And that's where I think I went wrong with my first attempt. You wanna lay it down in a mat in one direction and slightly overlap as you go. And then you do it 90 degrees. And again, you overlap as you go. And I used tea towels. They had a significant pattern or grain to them. You can see that it's got the clover leaves and that's a pretty big weave there. Um, and that was kind of detrimental to how the papyrus came out. When I put it in the press, it significantly impacted and transferred that pattern over to it and was able to see each little bump of the fabric on my final papyrus. And so that was kind of disappointing. I didn't expect that. It also delaminated on the right-hand side. And I think that's because I'd wiped all the glues off essentially of the plant strips before I put them down together. So I had to try this again. I gave myself a few months, thought about it. Uh, Kathy gave me some felts. Instead of using a towel, I was able to use a very nice thin material that was even all the way across. I didn't have as much plant material, but 
uh, on the right hand side, I at least had two miniature sheets again. And these are about five, four or five inches square. This is really tiny because these are really tiny stalks of plants that I was working with. And so it is kind of rather tedious to work with something so tiny. But I didn't wipe it. I just nice and wet, made that mat, let it all gel together. And then I also hammered it down one more time to kind of then squeeze out that extra water, put it in the press. And then you can see how that turned out, I think much better. It's very nice, it's stuck together, it stayed nice and smooth. And so this is more akin to what the ancient Egyptians would have been doing with their papyrus. The last step, which I haven't tried yet, is to burnish it. You take a stone or a shell or something and you rub it across the whole surface to further even it out, to kind of smooth out any more of those ridges. And then you're able to use a reed pen and, and write on it in theory. So that's kind of the next step in my, my experimentation. This is as far as I've gotten, but I was really happy with how the other one turned out. Um, so that is how making papyrus went for me. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'd love to answer them for you too. Um, I see in the comments that they grow papyrus in a greenhouse at the University of Michigan. Yes, that is amazing. Yeah, if you can visit that, that is so fantastic. We also have, um, yes, umbrella plant. That is how I ID that I have the different wrong kind of papyrus here in Houston at our botanic garden. Um, but it's been a fun experience. I loved giving it a try and I hope if anyone else is inspired, let me know. And I'll, if you have any more questions, happy to answer them too. Um, can you use more than two layers? I think it would get too thick and it probably wouldn't um, work very well. Um, two layers is sufficient to make that mat. Um, you could also try weaving it like a basket weave, but that also feels very complicated. Um, but that's another thing to try too. So Kathy is back. I, am I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so I just skipped ahead, Kathy, to the papyrus part. I'm going to jump back here to the timeline slide for you. And after that, jumping into the different plants and things. So we talked about the museum collection as well, um, about Good. some of the writing substrates that we have. Adrienne was nicely uh, was nice to fill in on her uh, experience with uh, with papyrus, and I, I'm gonna this is gonna be out of order, but I want to say that papyrus, tapa, and a mate cloth all are similar in that they are pressed, they are processed, the fibers processed. In some cases, they're boiled, not in papyrus, but in a mate and in a tapa cloth, and then they're hand beaten. And that's where it stops. And the difference between that and paper is that paper is hand beaten, but taking the fiber back to individual fiber. Where in the other three mentioned processes, you're just taking it and flattening the fiber that's there. You're not separating it as we do in a beater. So there's a difference because paper is actually described as a cellulose fiber that has been macerated and sieved through a screen. So uh, papyrus, tapa, and uh, amate have not been sieved through a screen, which makes them uh, not exactly technically paper, but they're used as paper. They're a flat surface, and people use them, obviously, for thousands of years. Um, so that said, Adrian gave you a, a good uh, show uh, an example of papyrus taking the reed and smashing it and uh, pounding it into itself. Long, thin uh, uh, stalks, as you can see. And this is the traditional Egyptian papyrus. So you can see at the top, it's like that feathery type of papyrus. This is true papyrus. True papyrus, lovely plant actually. And they're, they're around Houston and um, a lot of places, I'm sure. People use them as a decorative plant here too. Uh, vellum and parchment were created in Asia about 1500 a, a BC. And um, it was a very, and it still is a very strenuous uh, process of taking an animal skin and uh, having to clean it and do a lot of processing to it 
to come up with this uh, very nice substance. In many cases, the uh, skin are split, not across, but split in two, and, um, and as in layers. And one was used as leather for shoes, say, or clothing, and the inside, the softer part was the parchment. Vellum comes from baby uh, calves, and it's uh, the same process, just much softer and sadder, actually. Um, so, um, so those are processes that lead us up to paper. Um, the Chinese were... Um, and so briefly, we just have photos to help illustrate what is the good. cloth. That, good. Uh, yeah, beautiful thing. It's maybe a mate or tapa on the on the uh, left, and the other processes on the right. You can see the various uh, maybe um, wood blocks for printing, and uh, maybe even clay blocks. All various processes were used. Man used what was in his environment, you know, to print and to create surfaces to write on, um, and it still happens today. The 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 fibers used in paper making were the fibers that were available to the people of that country. So um, it was changing somewhat, but linen and flax were available almost everywhere. And that seems to be a very staple of early paper making. Um, cotton, more so in the West, I think, than in uh, the East. And there's the cotton ball. And it is different from the other uh, plants that are used because the other plants use the inner bark of the uh, of the plant and the cotton ball uses this this fruit I guess it, it may be a fruit I'm not sure um, of the uh, cotton ball so it's a different process and it needs to be uh, worked differently Asia came up in chi China uh, came up with this process about 2,000 years ago it was had been worked on previous to that, but it was declared a a a, a substance to the emperor of Japan uh, in about 105 A.D., and that is used as the uh, official date of paper being uh, discovered, if you will. But certainly, it was worked on before that. Um, so it was using the Chinese were using a variety of things. They the introduction of woven cloth, which I mentioned was um, 600 BC, I'm sorry, 6,000 BC, was used as an expensive form uh, of writing for writing. And as the Chinese were using this cloth that for clothing as well as for manuscripts, they were cutting off edges and little pieces and artisans realized they were wasting some very nice material. And the creative, perceptive, intuitive minds of the art artists at that time realized that they could possibly re, uh, reuse this fiber and adding it with other cellulose products like um, uh, leaves, roots, uh, bark, fishing net, all kinds of things were used originally to create paper. And they also realized they had to transform that fiber to make it something that they could use. And that was done through boiling. So the woody plants used in what would be considered Japanese uh, paper making style now are woody plants that need to be processed by boiling. And you're doing that with a wood ash or a, a to uh, get rid of the lignin, which is in the plant, is the binding in the plant, and it's also what what is used, uh, what is what is needed to to get hello, what is needed to uh, eliminate in, uh, for instance, newsprint. If you see newsprint and you notice how it browns over time, sulfur is used to get rid of the lignin in wood in present day, and the sulfur stays in the paper and it oxidizes and turns the paper brittle. In old, older times, uh, they were getting rid of lignin through the wood ash or soda ash, and um, but then they were continuing to process it by beating it after it's boiled, it's beaten and then hand formed into sheets. Uh, if we move into um, other areas, we will see that um, Slowly, um, this process was uh, was kept a secret 
in uh, China, but it slowly moved into Japan and Korea. So it stayed in that area. 700 years AD, Chinese paper makers were captured in a, uh, in a fight with Samarkand, with the Arabs, and the secret was really out because China had kept this as a secret as a power. They could sell it through the Silk Road. They could sell it to their neighbors, but no one knew how to make it. So suddenly the secret was out and it very slowly crossed North Africa, getting to Europe about 11, 1200 AD. This was a, uh, an interesting process because in Europe, those things changed, but cotton was used uh, more, a little bit more in Europe and cotton has to be processed differently. It is not boiled, but it is beaten. It, it's hand is beaten in a machine and it is then uh, formed into sheets. So your Western uh, material is a cotton. It's used similarly to any other paper. It is processed differently. Cotton has to be beaten mechanically and then hand formed. Well, the woody materials of the plants had to be boiled and then beaten and then formed into sheets. So there was a big difference there. We are showing first here's flax. And then our next slide would, as you see, it's a uh, next is the mulberry. You can see the long uh, branch of the mulberry is straight. The uh, leaves are taken off, of course. The bark is uh, steamed and then stripped off. And then there's an inner pith, a white pith that is attached to that bark. So it is, the bark is boiled again, and then it, the bark and the pith are separated by scraping, and you're scraping the bark off of the pith, leaving the white substance below. That's your mulberry. The other plants are done similarly. Abaca is, looks like a banana plant or banana tree, it has no bananas. Yes, we have no bananas. <laughs> it is the same. It's the inner bark of the uh, long, nice, um, sturdy plant. And it is also uh, beaten and processed. It's used um, through Western and uh, Eastern uh, paper making. I think it's kind of a, a neat trans transition fiber. It can be worked both ways, actually. I did not and then we it had, to be like a banana. So that surprised me. There's um, no fruit. It's a banana right. tree with no fruit. It's a cousin, like a cousin. <laughs> yeah, no fruit. Here's the hemp plant. It has been used, the hemp plant has been used for many different things over many years. Um, it was used for cloth for a long time, for rope. Uh, it can be used now for paper and it has, was used for paper. It, the same process, it has to be uh, boiled and beaten and to be hand screened. It yields a lot of paper as the other plants do, probably more than wood per acre, uh, but it is a lot of processing goes into that as well. Um, then we have next, bamboo. Ah, bamboo is wonderful. Um, on the right, you can see a beautiful sheets of bamboo that have been printed on the image being a bamboo. Uh, I love it. It is a, a sturdy. This is sturdy. It's, this is more looks more like papyrus the way it's laid out. It looks more like um, the actual uh, long fiber before it's beaten. But on the left, you can see where it has been beaten down and formed into sheets. So it's used two different ways. It's either stripped like papyrus are beaten into individual fibers and reformed as on uh, for paper on the left hand side. These are all wonderful plants. Bamboo has such an incredible uh, use and wood. Wood, yeah, let's go to wood. Wood is a wonderful surface. Um, the, I'm showing this as a, again, strips of wood that have been printed on. This is a book cover and it is uh, gorgeous. Very, very fragile. I had to, it's on a ring binding and I had to go back in and reconnect all those little torn uh, areas with little pieces of uh, Kozo actually. But wood is a wonderful process. And now we use that of course for paper in the West. Um, we have other things printed on wood. I have, we, I can show those later. Yeah, so thank you. That was our slideshow. 
So that's our slideshow. Okay, so let me. Get I would love to have you go more in depth into those processes and share some of the other treasures that you have. This is uh, this is there is so much more, but I, so let's go back to what I was showing. These are little pieces I have of parchment. Um, these are ordered, and they it's hard to see what they look like, but they are just nice little hard pieces. They uh, have a nice rattle to them, and there I believe is one person in Europe who does this now on a regular basis. It takes him a long time. Um, it is a fascinating thing and hard to do, obviously. Then I wanted to show some pieces I have of papyrus. And these, uh, Adrian showed you her process. And these are just more things that I got from the web. I ordered nice big sheets, as you can see. As Adrian had showed you, they're done by laying them across it per perpendicularly. So those are more papyrus sheets that are available. People are making these now. So let's go to flax. Um, linen, as you saw with those long starks, but this is flax after it's been broken down. See, here's just the fiber. It's been boiled and probably needs to be boiled, maybe beaten from now on. So that's what it's, a, a natural cover fiber. The other products you can get, here is abaca, which was, it, it, these come as, in a sheet, it's a linter sheet. So the, the fiber has been processed already and you can buy it then semi-beaten in sheets like this. And then you need a beater, I need a processor to break this down farther or uh, farther into uh, individual fibers so you can reform into sheets. That is what paper does. It breaks it down to the individual fibers as opposed to felting uh, or smashing it like papyrus. Um, this is, I believe, this is going to be a uh, flax. This is flax sheets also. So you can get these products in sheet form, some of them. Uh, there are supply houses in the country and in Canada that which, from which you can buy raw product or you can buy pre-beaten cotton and uh, some other fibers. Here's amate. I think we probably are all familiar with Mexican amate and is what people use to do wonderful, colorful paintings on in Mexico. It's again, it's a bark that's been uh, beaten into itself. Cozo, mulberry, this is the dry <laughs> cozo. This is a branch that's been steamed and stripped. So here's the dried white inner pith of the branch. Here's even a larger branch. It's just been folded up so you can see these are very long branches of the tree or the plant. And, and these that's need, Cozo, you said, from the mulberry? This is Cozo. This is the mulberry. Okay. And it needs to be, it's been uh, treated for you to a certain extent, but it needs to be uh, boiled more for several hours with soda ash or wood ash, and then it can be beaten. I hand beat it. it people do use uh, beaters, uh, machine beaters. I've never done it that way though. Um, another look is at some more bamboo. And this is from Myanmar. And these are sheets, sweet sheets of, of bamboo. So it's really been beaten down. You can see the big pieces are still there. So it has some fiber in it. And it has been printed on. I have some pretty um, So this actually has been um, not printed, but these are in the uh, leaves are in the paper and actually in the paper, which is a pretty. And then you can get cotton. Here's cotton that's been semi-processed again. This is a linter and it a letter sheet, and this needs to be beaten. So you can buy it like this, 
where I would tear it up. Um, I soak it in water for an, a day or two, and then I put it in my Hollander beater and uh, reduce it down to fiber. You can also buy it in what's called half stuff, which is loose fiber that's been cleaned, uh, bleached and cleaned and prepared. And it needs to be, again, beaten fully. Can so you, can you a, tap it again with your fingernails so we can hear that sound? Uh, yeah, it's thick. Okay. This is thick. Yeah, these are nice. And these, and it's it's a little crisper than here. You can listen. This is a little softer, but it, it still is thick. This is you're getting your your linters again. And these are nice ways to get your fiber. Now, one last thing. I think I had, I think we've showed you just about everything that I have right now. Um, but these are these are different. The difference in these fibers is that cotton is a very short fiber and it needs to be a thicker paper, usually to make it a stronger paper. Uh, because the woody plants we spoke about are longer fiber, you can get a much thinner paper with this and a much stronger paper. Um, it, they're wonderful to work with. That They take a little time to learn. I've been working with cotton so long that it's, it's easier for me, and uh, it's still a bit, of a, a bit of a learning process in dealing with these Western fibers. Uh, I mean, sorry, the Asian fibers, because they do take a little bit of difference um, learning how much soda ash, how much uh, uh, how much beading they take, those all are a little different than cotton. So um, if there are any questions you'd like to ask about these or any other fibers I can help you with or any um, information or supply places I can tell you about. We also have some books that are on paper. I think I gave to Adrian as a list of those. Um, Dard Hunter is the uh, has created the Bible. Uh, and no one has really matched that book since then, but there are lots of books out on the history and different uses of paper. But Dart Hunter is uh, the king, I think, of paper. Timothy Barrett is the next person who is, he is still living. Dart Hunter died quite a few years, a long time ago. Timothy Barrett is still here. He um, was teaching at University of Iowa and teaching uh, Western and uh, uh, Eastern paper making. He has written two books, one on Japanese paper making and one on European paper making, because Western paper making is considered European paper making. And those are two very good books for actual descriptions of what you do. I mean, these are how to books. He explains lots and lots about pulp. It's uh, a complex uh, I uh, subject matter and it starts out easy when you're just beating, but the more you get into beating, the kind of uh, the time you beat, the way you beat, if you have more pulp or less pulp, all those have a lot of effect on the type of paper you're making. Um, so there's for the reading paper making history and technique of ancient craft by Dard Hunter. This is a good one. Japanese paper making, European hand paper making, Timothy Barrett. Those are wonderful. Um, white magic on paper and paper through history are two books that have lots and lots of detail. They are reference books to me. I, I, they're not something you read like a novel. They are uh, fascinating and just chocked full of information. And then the very last is the L'Institut d'Histoire de, de Livre, which is, um, they have an English translation of this uh, extensive collection of where to go to find information about uh, the books and paper making. And uh, if you look at Institute of History of Paper of the book, uh, it will give you just pages and pages of references on all the different aspects of paper making. Uh, paper making is um, interesting in that there's no degree in paper making and there's no real single uh, uh, class in paper making to get any kind of uh, acknowledgement like that. I think paper, make paper makers have just you through trial and error is experience trial and error a lot of it book the book arts have included paper making in in their um scheduling and that's a good thing because up until that happened there was no real place for it museums and schools were uh teaching paper making for a while they realized it was difficult they 
mostly got rid of those programs. And then papermaking was not really available on uh, in most uh, in most campuses, I think, until they did add it to the book arts. I'm not sure when that happened, but certainly in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, when I started making papermaker in the 70s, you just had to figure it out. I mean, as far as and and so that's why I went to Japan and I went to uh, Italy to deal with these people who've been making paper for decades and decades and centuries. So now there's lots more written on it. There uh, are supply houses. Twin Rocker is a supply house in America. It's Twin Rocker is our main paper making hand mill in America is our only hand mill of that size in America. And they are internationally known for the paper they made. They've been, um, Catherine and Howard Clark developed this mill. They've now retired and sold it, I believe, to their um, their uh, master paper maker. But they uh, created a wonderful mill and a wonderful tradition and history of paper, handmade paper in America. Um, the carriage house and um, the paper were uh, the papers um, the carriage house and uh, the paper right and uh, are also two different places the paper right and the carriage house twin rocker paper house carriage paper I'm getting so confused paper <laughs> let me start over this has been a frustrating morning the paper right the carriage house and twin rocker are your three good places for supplies and for information uh, okay so. Now, any questions, any information people would like, or anything to add? If you have information, please add and let us know. Yeah, we're kind of asking the group in the chat uh, what other fibers or if we have any other paper makers. So Cotton and Abaca is one, um, been doing it for years. Uh, someone else makes uh, leaves from garden plants, such as iris and daylily. Absolutely. Paper is, a cellul is made from cellulose fiber. So cellulose fiber is plant fiber. So people have been uh, working with plants from their garden for decades. And yes, um, it's a matter of gathering those plants and pro learning how to process them and making them to paper. It is uh, easy to do if, if you, well, easy to find. Um, the process may be frustrating and figuring it out maybe uh, takes some trial and error, but I think it's fun. People have been working. And I think you can find samples and examples of all of various plants on the web, looking under handmade paper and handmade fibers, handmade plants, plants for hand paper making. And they're mentioned, I think, in some of these books too. Um, but cellulose fiber, which opens opens the category to millions of, of uh, available plants. Yeah, there was a question if uh, we'd made paper with sunflower stalks, and I hadn't considered that, but I think that would be really interesting. I think it'd be more like a, I don't know if I would try it like papyrus. I think probably better to, to beat and to, uh, yes, go through the beater. Yeah, you and you know, I don't, flowers. I don't know if anyone has actually made papyrus by beating it in a machine. You know, that's curious. Um, I don't know that people may have, because you do kind of the same thing. You'd have to break it down, but it, because it's more of a woody fiber, it may react differently. But woody fibers can be done in a machine in a, in a Hollander. That's uh, uh, the timing. You'd have to figure the timing out, and that's through trial and error again. <laughs> Paper making is trial and error. It really is a lot of trial and error. Yeah, it's a very fun art. We have uh, also a slide of the paper making studio at the yeah. former location here on yeah. the that Kathy had set up with the uh, denim and cotton and flax and cozo and abaca examples in the window so that people could peek in. And then there's Kathy on the left making some, I think that's abaca that day where we got to make paper. Uh, get our hands wet. Always a fun right. day at work. We There's Brian. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Brian, our director. Uh, so the printing museum is, is moving. And so when I say old location, my virtual background is a mock-up of what the new locations exterior would look like if we put murals up. But that's where we're moving to within Houston is going to be yeah. 121 San Jacinto Street. So we're just visiting. It's coming together soon. We are going to hope to reopen in January of 2023 I have to make sure I get my years right um, yeah. but we are going to have you know studios built out purpose built for us rather than our old space that we inhabited for 40 years which was um 
warehouse and an industrial printer at one point, a bank at one point, and it was a hodgepodge of a building. So to have a studio built out with paper making in mind, we're so thrilled to be able to do that. Um, and so that is that is where we are moving to. And I love to be able to welcome Kathy back in and set up the studio for us. Uh, yeah. She's been a long time printer. So she teaches a series of classes for us. Um, she teaches inter paper making, also paper with natural inclusions in it. Um, and then the other one is painting with colored pulp, which mm -hmm. is a very fun artistic That's fun. on it. If you're in the area, please join us at our new museum. We're excited at, at uh, 3121 San Jacinto here in Houston, looking for a big paper studio uh, and a lot of new classes. I'm also adding a class in Orizomi, uh, which is folding and dyeing paper. We'll do that for a family day next spring. It is wonderful and colorful and easy for everyone to do. But the paper making classes introduction are also fun for uh adults and uh, children. And we have, like Adrian said, we have a uh, painting with colored pulp is one. And another is adding inclusions to the paper, putting a sheet of paper, putting something down on it, and then putting another paper on top is one way. Adding things to the surface is a, another way. So we're add, adding things. Um, we have another couple of classes that I think are interesting where we will make paper one day and that same paper then will be used by the same people in a class with printing. So uh, it'll be a two part class making paper and then printing on that same paper. So that's those are going to be uh, coming up in the spring as well. So we're adding some interesting things for people uh, to make paper and to use it. So please join us. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, Kathy, so much. Thank you all for joining us. You have a great day. And thanks again for tuning in today. Bye.